really honored to be here and chat with all of you today. Um, these are some pictures I've taken in my career as a wildlife photographer that helped bring me on the journey that I'm going to lead you on today. I've been talking about saving sharks for a few years, but my tune has changed dramatically. Now I'm not so much into saving sharks, now I want to start a revolution. And I think you guys are going to be a part of it. So here it goes. As a kid, I was chubby and I stuttered and I ended up liking animals a lot more than I liked people. And sharks, for me, were the coolest. You know, sharks weren't chubby, they didn't stutter, sharks were badass. <laughs> sharks had two more senses than people. They survived five major extinctions that wiped out most life on Earth. You know, of all the animals on the planet that were the kings, that were the coolest, sharks were my favorite. And everybody was afraid of them, so it gave me a little bit of an edge. And I met my first shark when I was nine, and instead of being this menacing predator of people, it was afraid of me. And every shark I met after that was afraid of me as well, and I quickly learned that the public's perception of sharks was totally different than the reality. The reality is, every year, people swim in the oceans more than seven billion times. Seven billion times, and 60 to 90 people get bitten by sharks every year. You couldn't interact with a house cat seven billion times and expect to get messed up only 60 or 90 times. <laughs> You're more likely to be killed by a vending machine than you are to be killed by a shark. So the reality is totally different. And as you heard, I took a photo assignment, the biggest photo assignment of my life, the most exciting trip I'd ever had, to the Galapagos Islands to photograph my favorite species of shark in the world, hammerhead sharks. Now, sharks have been on the planet for 450 million years, but hammerheads are only 70 million years old. They're a recent evolutionary experiment. And the two more senses I talked about that sharks have are concentrated in their snouts, so hammerheads have a huge sensory system. And they're one of the only sharks in the world that's social. They congregate in schools of mostly females. And they control their position in the school using aggressive displays. Amazing animals. It took me three days to get to the Galapagos Islands. And when I arrived, instead of sharks in all their majesty underwater in the most protected marine reserve on Earth, I found a fishing line that would stretch from Earth to outer space. And hundreds of dead and dying sharks. And I quickly learned that sharks were being killed in the most protected places on the planet. And the rest of the world, which was unprotected, was in even worse shape. Shark populations had dropped 90% in 30 years. And no one knew and no one cared because, well, maybe people are afraid of sharks. Maybe the oceans are a, a big unknown world that, you know, we, what goes on out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. So I tried to make a shark movie. And if any of you guys know anything about it, you know, we ended up joining up with a conservation group called Sea Shepherd. Sea Shepherd rammed a pirate fishing boat in Guatemala. We got charged with attempted murder in Costa Rica. The Taiwanese Mafia was behind it because of how much money there is in shark fins. Shark fins are the big deal. Shark fin soup is a dish that was once originally reserved for royalty, way back when in China. And when China began wide-scale trade with the rest of the world in the mid-80s, middle class started booming. Now everybody in China can enjoy shark fin soup. And a single kilogram of shark fins is worth about $800. So that means in every country with a coastline, people were catching sharks, pulling them out of the water, cutting off just their fins, and throwing the rest of the body back, wasting 95% of the animal, cutting off their fins when they're often still alive. Horrible practice, deplorable practice, and we're doing this for the sake of a soup, a delicacy reserved for the wealthy, destroying one of the oldest, longest lasting, most important predators the planet has. So, this movie, Little Shark Film, took five years, 15 countries, nearly killed me. And we finally had a premiere of the movie in China, where the greatest demand for shark fin soup is. And this was the highest point of my life. And at the movie premiere, someone in the audience puts up their hand and she says, what's the point of stopping us from eating shark fin soup if, according to the United Nations, all the world's fisheries will have collapsed by 2048 anyways? And for me, that was a devastating blow. You know, I almost died trying to save sharks, and now we're going to lose all the fish? We're going to eat all the fish? The study came out from Dalhousie University in Halifax, one of our prominent schools here in Canada, showing that if current rates of overfishing continue, all the world's fisheries will have collapsed by 2048. Devastating blow. I quickly learned that all, most of the carbon we put into the atmosphere as well doesn't just stay in the atmosphere. A lot of it gets absorbed by the oceans, creating carbonic acid. The oceans are now 30% more acidic than they were 100 years ago which is a devastating problem. And groups of the top coral reef scientists in the world think we're gonna lose all the world's coral reefs sometime between the year 2050 and 2100. Now this is a massive issue. Coral reefs are the most biodiverse ecosystems we have on the planet. They represent at least 25% of the species known on planet Earth. They've been here for more than 500 million years. 60% of the world's fisheries are born on coral reefs. So if we lose coral reefs, this is a massive, massive, massive problem. In this release of the shark movie, we kept going to these environmental 
film festivals and environmental conferences and the scientists we'd meet would say, you know, what you're doing with sharks is cool, but you're missing the point entirely. It's not save the sharks, it's not save the pandas hugging trees anymore. Conservation is different. Conservation's changed. It's now the preservation of human life on Earth. What are we going to do to save humans? So, by the year 2048, when we will have lost all the fisheries if current fishing trends continue, we'll also have lost all the world's rainforests if current deforestation trends continue. We'll also have 9 billion people on a planet that is struggling to feed the 7 billion people we have right now. Already, 1 billion people around the world don't have enough food. 20% of the planet does that, doesn't have enough fresh drinking water, and that's going to double in the next 25 years. We're running out of stuff. So this is a much, much bigger issue for me than saving sharks, and, and we've been trying to tackle this for quite a bit of time. And what the conclusion we've come to is that we built a system doomed to fail. Think of yourself as a body, as an organism. You know your consumption. You know how much food you need to take in in a day to survive. You know if you ride a bike, if you drive a car, what you're consuming and what level of destruction you bestow upon the world. But expand that vision a little bigger. What if you were to think of your house as an organism? What if you were to think of this whole science center as an organism, as Toronto as an organism? Think of the consumption of these larger bodies. What kind of consumption does the city of Toronto take? You know, what, what does it take to keep Toronto going, to keep New York going, to keep Hong Kong going? These are not sustainable. To feed Toronto, to put the energy in Toronto, you've got to go to the natural world, destroy a bunch of it, ship it here, and that's what we've been doing. And that's why our very life support systems are in jeopardy this century. By, by the middle of the century, no reefs, no rainforest, 9 billion people, not enough food for everybody, not enough water. We are in trouble. So the issue now is save the humans. This is the biggest issue humanity's ever been up against. It's not like a world war. It's not like we're going to battle to save Great Britain. Now we are in battle to save civilization. And the scientists, they're pretty unanimous on this. We're consuming too much in every level. There's not one trend, not one environmental trend other than the ozone layer and whaling that we've turned around for the positive. We've known about climate change for 100 years. We've known about deforestation and overfishing. Every single one of these issues has gotten worse. Now we know from looking at the archaeological sites of prior civilizations that when they've gone on a destructive path like we're on, they have declined and eventually collapsed. And something that's universal about all of these and universally human, that's equally terrifying, is when we've gone in that direction, we've ended up eating each other. So think of Alive the movie, when an airplane goes down in the, in the Alps, you know, instead of dying without a food, you're going to eat somebody. And if, you know, if your family's dying, if your civilization's crumbling and there's a nice tasty person over there, you might go smash their skull and eat them to feed your family before you die yourself. So the issue is, we are all literally in this together. We are going to make it as a civilization, or we are going to break it. But we've had massive change in the past. If you look at the changes we've had, from the center of slavery, from the women's suffrage movement, from the women's rights movement, these were all seemingly impossible tasks that we brought to ourselves, and that we knew we had to do something about it. These were massive revolutions, and they all had a few commonalities. One, there was a gross atrocity. It was atrocious that people were oppressed and that there was not equality. It is atrocious that we're destroying the most important ecosystems for our own survival within our own generation. You know, 100 years ago, there were 2 billion people on planet Earth. Now, there are 7 billion people, going to 9 billion people. Why? Why are we doing this? Why are we focused on growth and consumption? The system we built, capitalism, the system we built, civilization, depends on continual growth, but we're in a finite system. We've got finite resources, finite forests, finite oceans, finite plants, finite everything. So it will go to a point and it will collapse. And what we're trying to do right now is to bring the attention to everybody that if we know we're going in this direction, perhaps we can do something about it. We're the first generation, the first civilization that has enough foresight to say, we're going down the tubes and we need to turn it around. There's a few opportunities in all this, and a bunch of great opportunities. One of them is, in every generation, we get to decide, you know, are we going to condemn future generations to lack and starvation and crisis or not? Are we going to turn this around or not? And in the face of the greatest adversary humanity has ever had, it's going to call into being the greatest heroes, and it's going to bring people together, and people are going to get to decide, you know, am I going to work for good? I think in a world where we're stuck in video games and text messages and we're lacking a lot of meaning in our life, 
we can wake up every day and decide, oh my God, I'm going to go to battle to save civilization. I'm going to go to battle to save ecosystems and species. And I think what you'll find if you try this yourselves is it's enormously fun, enormously rewarding, and there's a lot of awesome people that are going to help you. When we made the shark movie, my belief system was that if people just knew what was going on, if they knew that this dish was being consumed and that the consumption of this dish was causing the demise of one of the most important predators the planet has, that they'd do something about it. You know, I believe that humanity is morally tied together. That's one of the things that we have that binds us, is that we have a sense of right and wrong. Things feel bad to us for a reason. It makes me sad if I see an animal dying for a reason, and we should respond to that. And what happened with the shark movie, I got a phone call like six months ago from a grade six teacher in Saipan, in Micronesia, named Kathy Begapular. And Kathy said, I've showed my grade six class your documentary, and they're pissed. And they're going to do something about it. And I said, cool. I sent them some more Sharkwater DVDs and said, whatever I can do to help. Wicked. Two months later, I got another phone call, and they said they've gotten a bill proposed and unanimously passed through the Senate to make Saipan the second place in the world to entirely ban shark fins. And they invited me to Saipan for the actual signing by the governor. So I flew to Saipan, met a grade six class who decided, you know, this is not right, something needs to change, and they made it happen themselves. When we started Sharkwater, there were four countries that had banned shark finning. When we finished, there were 16. Now there's more than 95 countries that have banned the process of shark finning, but in none of those countries is the importation of shark fins illegal, which means you can fin as many sharks as you want as long as you put the fins on a shipping boat before they bring them into port, not a fishing boat, which is a massive loophole. So a little success in Saipan is a huge step in the right direction to protect sharks, just like a ban on ivory protects elephants, because you can't tell what shark fin is from a fin shark, what elephant ivory is from a poached elephant, and what isn't. Shortly after the success in Saipan, a grade 7 class on the island of Guam said, if a grade 6 class can do this, well, the hell, we can do it too. <laughs> they filled the Senate room so much and testified that no fisherman could get in to do the same thing. California, Maryland, Washington, Oregon, Toronto, Mississauga, Brantford have all banned shark fins now because they were made aware of an issue. So the successes are rolling out and rolling out and rolling out. And what I'm hoping now is that you guys are being made aware of the larger issues. You know, our consumptive patterns, our civilization, the world that we're in is destroying the world we depend on for survival in a very real way. We depend on the oceans. The oceans give us 70% of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. The plants, you know, the, the world we're destroying is, is the very world we need to live in. We need this stuff. And I think we like this charismatic animals and we like these ecosystems for a reason and we really should be listening to that. So the opportunity here, the opportunity is that now that you guys are aware of these atrocities, that we're morally bound together. You're morally bound to me. And when you start making decisions, I think you might be making different ones. Hopefully, knowing your consumption of these dishes of your consumption patterns need to change. Lifestyles in North America. If everyone consumed like we did, we would need six planet Earths to sustain life. Six of them. We don't have six planet Earths. We have one. So we need to change things dramatically and in a real quick fashion. I went to the uh, climate change conference in Copenhagen about two years ago, and 100,000 protesters hit the streets. They were fist pumping, saying, we want environmental policy right now. Yet the governments did nothing. And that was COP15, the conference, the United Nations Conference on Climate Change. The 15th time the world's best and brightest leaders had gathered for two weeks to try to come to an agreement to save civilization. And did they? No. 100,000 protesters gathered in the streets to show them they wanted support. The biggest protests on anything in history. And did they do it? No. Why? Because the destruction of the world we depend on for survival is enormously profitable. Oil is profitable. Deforestation is profitable. Canada has the Alberta tar sands. The Alberta tar sands is the biggest oil reserve on the planet. It's also the most destructive industrial project on the face of the earth. When they're done, they will have destroyed an area somewhere between the size of England and Wales combined and the size of Florida. And they're doing this on land that isn't even technically theirs. It's First Nations land. And Canada signed what was called the Kyoto Protocol a number of years ago that mandated a reduction in carbon emissions. Not only have their carbon emissions gone up, but because they signed this agreement, it means they're breaking their own law within their own country. Why would Canada do such a thing? They're subsidizing the Alberta tar sands to the tune of $3 billion a year 
is given to the Alberta tar sands. So the biggest, most profitable corporations in the world, the BPs, the Shells, the Imperial Oils, your taxpayer dollars are going to fund the most destructive, most expensive, profitable companies in the world. And that is part of the problem. We right now have a very real connection between the government and our corporations. And I don't think this can exist in the future. It's beyond the realm of political accountability. We have a government official that's in office for four, maybe eight years, but we're trying to get them to put in environmental legislation that's gonna last 20 years even though they're funded by the companies that are the most profitable, that are destroying the world we depend on for survival. All this needs to change. Revolution is the answer. And I think you guys have an enormous opportunity to go forth and do something different. You're young, you've got a bright future ahead of you, and you can choose any pathway you want to go. And the coolest thing about it is the way the world's been working, what's been going on out there, what you've been taught. You know, you go to school, you get married, you get a job, you retire, and you die, and you play golf and video games because your life sucks. None of that stuff has to matter anymore. You can do things in an entirely new way. And you should do things in an entirely new way. And now, because we know the system we've been building and the direction we've been going is so destructive, it is your duty to go out there and do something different. Challenge the status quo and figure out how to save the world yourself. Thanks.